Okay, let's start with uh, calcium carbonate or TUMS. So uh, we're going to pair each of these up so that you have a reference point. You really don't want to try to memorize things by themselves. It's a lot easier to remember two things together than it is to remember one alone. So uh, what we'll pair calcium carbonate or TUMS up with is magnesium hydroxide, milk of magnesia, and that'll come up in the next slide. So both of them are antacids. Uh, they work very quickly. Uh, a couple minutes, they should provide some relief. Uh, and they're receptorless. That just means that they go into your stomach and increase the pH, uh, which sounds a little bit strange, but you're increasing the alkalinity and you're decreasing the acidity. Um, but uh, these uh, drugs work uh, very quickly because of that. Uh, the generic name and chemical name are the same. Uh, so uh, calcium carbonate is the generic name, it's also the chemical name, and magnesium hydroxide is the chemical name, it is the generic name. Uh, calcium is on the periodic table of elements, uh, under 20, and then uh, just 8 away from it uh, is magnesium, so that means they're right under each other. So calcium is right under magnesium, uh, and they both have that plus 2 charge uh, when ionized. So uh, thinking about you know, how we can remember them, well, Tums, I don't want to call it chalky, but it's definitely a tablet that kind of breaks apart. Uh, they come in fruit flavors. Sometimes there's a mint one. And uh, just like on the period periodic table of elements, you'll find them on the over-the-counter shelf right uh, next to each other or above each other. So magnesium hydroxide, or milk of magnesia, as I said, is also an antacid. Its generic name and chemical name are the same. And on the periodic tables of elements, uh, magnesium is 12. What's important really is that when do we use Tums and when do we use milk of magnesia? Well, Tums, because of its calcium component, can also be used as a calcium supplement. Milk of magnesia, if you take enough of it, it has a bit of a laxative effect. So if you have constipation, milk of magnesia would be the right choice. Uh, if you want to help with um, calcium supplementation, uh, calcium carbonate would be the choice. Uh, and then as an antacid, um, either one would be uh, fine. Uh, but we're also introducing the idea of solid versus liquid preparations. Famotidine and ranitidine I'll put together uh, as the next two. So famotidine is pepsid, and it's an H2 blocker. What that means is that we have antihistamines, and technically it's an antihistamine. There's a histamine 1 and a histamine 2. And histamine 1, that's the allergies histamine. Uh, so we don't say H1 because when we discovered those, we didn't know there would ever be a 2. So antihistamines just talks about allergy antihistamines like Benadryl and Claritin and Zyrtec and Allegra and those types of things. But an H2 blocker, uh, if you block histamine 2, you block the introduction of acid into the stomach. And we can recognize these by their stem. Now there's a lot of misinformation on the internet about stems and suffixes and prefixes and I'm not going to go into it too much into uh, these slides. Uh, it's in the book. Uh, the whole book explains it. But I want you to know that tadine is an official stem. Uh, it comes from the original cimetidine. Uh, and they took the last six letters and said, okay, if you're going to introduce an H2 blocker as a manufacturer of these medications, you need to have T-I-D-I-N-E uh, at the end of them. And this is helpful because this lets you know the four that are out there, cimetidine, famotidine, ranitidine, and nizatidine, um, by just knowing uh, those six letters. Uh, the brand name, uh, it's, I think they did a pretty good job. You're not allowed to say exactly what it is, uh, but uh, peptic uh, means digestive and acid. Uh, obviously, you're trying to reduce acid, so peptic plus acid uh, makes pepsid. AC. Uh, Pepsid's companion is uh, Zantac or Ranitidine. Uh, and again, these uh, letters in front of the stem don't really mean anything. They're just 
meant to separate one from the other. And that uh, Zantac, it comes in the 75 milligrams, but also uh, uh, twice as much, 150 milligrams. It's also an H2 blocker, and you recognize that from the T-I-D-I-N-E stem, Tadine. And if you look at the name and you take away the Z, or Z, as they say uh, in the UK, uh, it's an antagonist plus acid. Okay, so uh, this is a way to uh, remember what this one's for. Okay? But again, I've paired two antacids and I've paired two H2 blockers. Okay? So now I'm going to pair a couple of proton pump inhibitors. Okay? S-omeprazole actually came after omeprazole, uh, but I'll explain why this one's first. So S-omeprazole alphabetically, though, comes before omeprazole, and within a class, I've tried to alphabetize them. So C before M, calcium before magnesium, F before R, famotidine before ranitidine, s omeprazole before omeprazole, and this will help with memorization. Now, in the book, I go over you know the 200 drugs, and my expectation is that by the end of the book, you can memorize all 200 drugs in order. Um, I've done it, and I know that you can do it as well. Uh, but in here, I'm just keeping those pairings uh, to make it easy to recognize which one should be on the shelf next to each other. So what is a proton pump inhibitor? Well, going back to our chemistry, uh, proton is uh, something that has to do with acidity. And if we stop protons from going into the stomach, we reduce that acidity. Uh, the stem is prazole, P-R-A-Z-O-L-E. So if something ends in prazole, it should be a proton pump inhibitor. Now there's an exception to this with some prescription items, antipsychotics that end with piprazole, P-I-P-R-A-Z-O-L-E. Um, this was discouraged by the World Health Organization and uh, you know, they still came out, I think, with a new uh, piprazole. But for the most part, prazole, you should notice that it's a proton pump inhibitor. And then if you think of next, uh, plus hydronium, so hydronium uh, is the ionized form of this acid, um, that might be a way to remember it. And then next means that, well, prilosec came first and nexium came next, uh, and they're the same thing. But we can also look at the colors, though, and see that they're very similar. So you see a yellow background here uh, with a purple pill. And then when we get to the next one, you'll see just a purple background in this purple pill. Uh, maybe also easy uh, to remember that. Omeprazole, uh, this came first, and this is also a proton pump inhibitor. Uh, the stem is prazole, and I mentioned that before. And if you look at the brand name, you can think of protons, or the PR from protons, and then the LO for low, and then SEC for the word secretion. So protons low secretion to remind you that it's a proton pump inhibitor, uh, and it's going to help with uh, secretion and hyperacidic conditions. So we've paired two antacids, two H2 blockers, two proton pump inhibitors. Uh, next, we're going to uh, pair two antidiarrheals together. Bismuth subsalicylate is Pepto-Bismol. Uh, don't, don't confuse that with um, Pepto-Children's, uh, which is just calcium carbonate or Tums. Uh, so the SAL, S-A-L, uh, recognize that as a salicylate, and this is uh, dangerous in children, especially if they have some kind of uh, fever or chicken pox or something like that. Uh, we can have some kind of issue with Ray syndrome. Uh, so again, this is Pepto-Bismol for adults. Um, the stem is sal. Uh, I mentioned that already. Um, but uh, the salicylate component, when we think of salicylates, we usually think of analgesia uh, as an aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid. Uh, but in this case, uh, we're really memorizing the sal uh, to remember one of the adverse effects or one of the contraindications uh, that we shouldn't give it in children. Um, it's, if you look at the word Pepto-Bismol, you can think of peptic, which means digestive. Uh, you can think of bismuth uh, as uh, number 83 on the periodic table. Uh, it causes some uh, darkening of the tongue, maybe of the stool, uh, but this effect is harmless. Uh, the other uh, antidiarrheal is loperamide or emodium. And this one 
doesn't really have a stem. Uh, there's nothing in it that says what it is. An amide is just a certain kind of uh, chemical structure. But if you just think of the word peristalsis, uh, peristalsis is that movement in your stomach which gets uh, things going. And if you think of it as low peristalsis, uh, that might be a way to remember the generic. Uh, low paramide is for l lowering peristalsis or slowing it, okay, or slow peristalsis. Um, and then the word emodium, uh, if you think of the word immobile, uh, slowing things down, something that doesn't move, uh, that might be uh, helpful as well uh, for memorization. Uh, the next medication, docusate sodium. Uh, colase. Uh, this is actually not really a laxative, it's more of a stool softener. Uh, it's going to bring a lot of water into the bowel, so a lot of times when we say take with water we mean it's a horse pill or a large pill and uh, taking it with water would be helpful. In this case uh, it can really dehydrate the patient, so you want to really uh, make sure the patient knows that they should take with water. If you know they even get to the pharmacist, again this is over the counter, they could just pull it off the shelf and you know, check out without any counseling. And then uh, colon's pace. I know it doesn't exactly work in the colon, but if you think of colase and slowing the colon's pace, um, or speeding the colon's pace, I'm sorry, uh, then maybe that would be uh, a way to remember what colase does. Um, polyethylene glycol, or Miralax. So this sort of has a stem. Uh, the stem for polyethylene glycol is uh, PEG, P-E-G, uh, and you can pull those letters out of um, the generic name. Uh, it's an osmotic laxative, uh, so uh, it's very safe. Uh, it can be used um, in children, and uh, when I look at that brand name, I think it's a miracle laxative or it's a miracle how well you, good you feel after you've used this laxative, something like that. Uh, but the word, the letters LAX for laxative uh, are in there. Okay. Uh, this is the first of the musculoskeletal drugs, uh, aspirin. And this is the regular analgesic strength aspirin, 325 milligrams. Uh, its brand name is Ecotrin. And let me talk about non-steroidal and then I'll talk about the, the name. So a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug is trying to compare it to maybe like a prednisone that is steroidal. And what we're saying is it's not that. Uh, so it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And if you take the N, the S, the A, the I, and the D, you get NSAID. So it's pronounced for the first letter N, and then we just say the word said. Uh, if you really want to get into it, it's an initialism plus an acronym. Uh, the way that you would uh, maybe say, like, oh, I can't think of anything right now. But, uh, for example, ROTC, R-O-T-C. Uh, R-O-T-C is an initialism. ROTC is an acronym. Uh, but it's important that you not say NACET. So a lot of people want to put an A after the N because N and S together, uh, it just doesn't, normally you don't say that uh, in the English language. So it's as if it were spelled E-N-S-A-I-D. Uh, ASA in acetyl salicylic acid, uh, so these are different ways that we refer to aspirin. If you look at acetyl salicylic and acid and you take the A, the S, and the A away, uh, that's where we come up with the initialism ASA. And then the brand name uh, comes from enteric coated aspirin. So something that is enteric is going to go through the enteral system or the GI system. Something that is paraenteral or parenteral is going to go outside the GI system. So what this is, is this is coated so that it doesn't hurt the stomach um, and can pass through uh, to treat some kind of uh, pain, uh, fever, um, a couple other things that aspirin is good for. Ibuprofen or Motrin. Uh, this has a stem, uh, the Profen stem, and there are some brand non-steroidals that also have that Profen stem. Um, so again, this is also a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. It's similar to aspirin, 
but because it can be safely used in children, uh, it certainly has its own niche. Uh, just a reminder, if you're looking in the OTC aisles, you really do want to have a pharmacist with you, especially if you're looking for something for kids, because the adult Motrin is in a different place than the children's Motrin, and then children's and infants tend to be different when we're talking about these kinds of drugs. So an infant is someone under two, and usually you have to have somebody specifically dosing that. Uh, and then a child is someone from two to 12, something like that. Uh, but anytime you're looking for Motrin for a child, you really should get some help. Um, so again, I mentioned the stem is profen, uh, and then this just goes to visual literacy. Why is it that Motrin is this bright orange and then Advil is that blue. So if you look on the color wheel, those are exactly opposite each other. And I don't know who came first, the Motrin or the Advil, but somebody said, you know, I really want this to stand out because if it looks just like it, then we're gonna look just like we're the same thing. So to have something stand out the most, you just go opposite the color wheel. So again, this is kind of a tangent, but a way to remember that they're both related uh, is that Motrin orange is opposite Advil blue on the color wheel. Okay. Uh, ibuprofen uh, or Advil, so the exact same generic drug. Um, Advil is another brand name for the over-the-counter medication and as I mentioned the colors, just a way to remember that those are related in some way. Uh, same thing, stem is profen, uh, and I always thought of Advil helping with the anvil. So in a lot of cartoons, uh, you'll see an anvil fall on one of the characters and they get a headache. And Advil and anvil are only separated by one letter. So the way to remember that Advil is for uh, that kind of pain is just think of that anvil falling on the character's head. Uh, so aspirin, ibuprofen, uh, those really need to be taken up to four times a day. Uh, but the next medication, naproxen, uh, only needs to be taken uh, probably like twice a day. And uh, this is also a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, we see the endings are similar. Now, proxen isn't an official stem, uh, but proxen and profen uh, only are separated by that one letter. Uh, and maybe that's a way that you can remember those are related as non-steroidals. Uh, when I think of the brand name, I think of Aleve and alleviating your pain. Uh, so uh, that also maybe uh, can help you uh, remember this one. A drug that's talked about quite a bit with uh, these non-steroidals is Tylenol. And this is acetaminophen or paracetamol if you're coming from the UK. And the brand name is Tylenol. So this is a non-narcotic analgesic. Uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen is often paired with narcotics. Uh, so the brand name of Vicodin, a prescription drug, has hydrocodone, which is a narcotic, and acetaminophen, which is non-narcotic. Um, so we're, again, we're trying to define it, and we have to define it by what it's not. So just as aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen are non-steroidals, non-steroids, acetaminophen is a non-narcotic. Okay? So it's a little like defining non-fiction by saying it's not fiction. So you're not really defining it, you're just saying what it's not. Uh, the name, or the short names, uh, APAP or Tylenol, come from the chemical name N-acetylparaaminophenol. What good is N-acetylparaaminophenol? Well, if you're an organic chemist, it, you can draw it from just that description uh, relatively easily. But you can see that we take the A from acetyl, the P from para, the A from amino, and the P from phenol. As far as Tylenol, they just took the TYL from the acetyl and the ENOL from the phenol uh, to come up with that name. Uh, that's how we used to do it. Uh, but now, uh, once you get a stem, then every drug coming after that should be similar. Okay. Acetaminophen, aspirin, and caffeine, uh, Excedrin migraine. I like this drug because it's a combination drug and kind of brings together a number of the drugs that we just talked about. So acetaminophen, a non-narcotic analgesic, uh, that helps with the migraine pain. Uh, the aspirin, 
Uh, it helps with pain and inflammation. Acetaminophen doesn't uh, help with the inflammatory process. So it's nice to have aspirin helping in that way. Why wouldn't you just use aspirin and just skip the acetaminophen altogether? There's a school of thought that if you have two medications and they do something similar, then hopefully you can reduce the dosage of both and hopefully you'll keep below the adverse effect threshold of both. Uh, so the idea is that we don't have to do full 325 milligrams of aspirin. We don't have to do the full 500 milligrams of acetaminophen or 650 for the extra strength. And that way maybe we can reduce uh, the side effects. Uh, the caffeine seems a little bit weird. You wanna be wide awake while you're having your headache? Uh, no, uh, the idea is that maybe the headache is an issue of vasodilation, so a vessel in the brain opening up. Caffeine tends to constrict or narrow uh, blood vessels. So the idea is that it's going to narrow the blood vessel in the brain uh, and relieve that pain. So acetaminophen, the non-narcotic analgesic, uh, the aspirin, uh, the anti-inflammatory, and caffeine, a vasoconstrictor, uh, all together working in concert uh, to help get rid of uh, migraine pain.